Well, it now becomes my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Mr. Lance Azumi serves as civilian aide to the Secretary of the United States Army. Pardon me. Appointed in 2019 by the Pentagon, he promotes positive relations between the Army and the public in the Sacramento area and advises the Secretary and other top Army leaders on regional issues. Lance was direct commissioned as a captain in the California State Military Reserve, where he served as a public affairs officer at state headquarters. He served from 1991 to 1996 and was awarded the California Commendation Medal, the Achievement Ribbon, and the Unit Citation Ribbon. He is the president of the Community Relations Board for the U.S. Army's Northern California Recruiting Battalion. In 2016, he was awarded the Army's Outstanding Civilian Service Medal, the third highest award the Army can bestow upon a civilian. Lance is also Senior Director of the Center for Education at the Pacific Research Institute. He has written and produced books, studies, and films on a wide variety of educational topics. His 2019 book, Choosing Diversity, which profiles successful charter schools, includes a chapter on our very own John Adams Academy. From 2004 to 2015, he served as a member of the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges and served two terms as president of the board. From 2015 to 2018, Lance chaired the Board of Directors of the Foundation for California Community Colleges and rem remains a member of that board. Lance served a commissioner as a commissioner on the California Post-Secondary Education Commission and as a member of the United States Civil Rights Commission's California Advisory Committee. He served as Chief Speech Writer and Director of Writing and Research for California Governor George Duke Mijian and as Speech Writer to United States, States Attorney General Edwin Meese III in President Ronald Reagan's administration. Lance received his Juris Doctorate from the University of Southern California School of Law his Master of Arts in Political Science from the University of California at Davis, and his Bachelor of Arts in Economics and History from the University of California at Los Angeles. Without further ado, I, it is my honor and privilege to welcome Mr. Lance Izumi to the podium. Well, thank you very much, Tamara for that very, very kind introduction. And I'm gonna start my remarks actually uh, today just by saying hi to my daughter, Lauren, who's actually watching from way out in Indiana right now. So dad says, hi, Lauren. Hope you're doing all right there. <laughs> I love you. So uh, although it's a day early, let me wish everyone here a uh, early happy vet Veterans Day. Uh, I especially want to wish a happy Veterans Day to all the parents uh, here and who are watching on this broadcast and who have sons and, do and or daughters or loved ones who have served or are serving in the armed forces of our nation. It is always a great pleasure for me to visit John Adams Academy and to have the opportunity to speak to members of the John Adams family. And that's not just some pleasant platitude, I am telling you uh, the truth. Uh, I truly love your school. It embodies everything that I believe is vital to the education of our young people. From rigorous subject matter to instructional methods that promote deep and critical thinking to the embedding of core virtues and the principles of servant leadership in a learning program. John Adams Academy is a model of excellence in education. And that is why I continue to write about your school. In fact, just last week, the Pacific Research Institute published my co-authored article on the need for patriotic education in America. And I use John Adams Academy as one of the prime examples for policymakers to examine and to replicate. And that brings me to the subject of patriotism, which is so important as we celebrate Veterans Day. I've often told the story of the first time I visited John Adams Academy I was at the flagpole just outside here, 
And at the start of the school day, the bell rang and a flood of your young scholars came flooding out of the building. And they all ringed that flagpole and they all started singing a patriotic song. I was so moved by that first impression of your school. I looked all around me and I saw all these young people singing a song celebrating America's heritage. And it choked me up. I thought to myself, no wonder hundreds of cars lined up to get into that parking lot, right? On that, for that informational meeting to when John Adams Academy was established. But patriotism is more than just singing a song, is emotional and as fulfilling as that can be. For many people nowadays, especially too many of our young people, there is little understanding of what real patriotism means. How do we know this? Look at the polls of young people in our country. Take, for example, a just released October 2020 poll conducted by the polling organization YouGov for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. A shocking 28% of Gen Z, uh, who are defined as being young people between 16 and 23, a shocking 28% of Gen Z have a favorable view of communism. In other words, more than one in four members of our youngest measurable population thinks that an ideology that is responsible for the deaths of more than 100 million people and supports the overthrow of the United States as we know it, is actually okay, and that's great. And here's an equally shocking statistic. 37% of Gen Z either believe or don't know if the Declaration of Independence is a greater guarantee of freedom than the Communist Manifesto. This data indicates that our young people are not getting the education that will fully inform them, not just about the horrors of communism, but what makes America a great and exceptional nation. Dr. Gary Houchins, who is an education professor at Western Kentucky University, recently wrote, a, wrote that patriotic education is less about the specific curricular concepts that are featured in American history classes and more about a philosophical stance, one full of explicit values and assumptions. What are these assumptions? Dr. Houchin says that a key is the belief that America's founding is a good thing. It is amazing that we live now in a time where more than a few people, especially our young people, do not actually believe that. According to Dr. Houchin's Believing that our founding was a good thing means that we believe that the events of 1776, the subsequent efforts to create the U.S. Constitution, and the next 244 years of trying to help the U.S. live up to its founding ideals represents a significantly positive development in human political and social history. This includes, he says, the assumption that the United States is an exceptional country not in the sense that it is better than any other country, but that it is unique and offers a uniquely valuable model of political organization that is worth cherishing and defending. Dr. Houchins emphasizes that this does not mean that we hide in any way or gloss over or neglect the many ways that we have failed to live up to our founding principles. In fact, he says that the story of extending basic political rights and equal opportunity to all Americans is a key to our history. Now, my family is a perfect example of what Dr. Houchins is talking about. My grandfather, on my mother's side, uh, was a wonderful man. His name was Hyosuke Wada. I knew him as that kind old man who couldn't speak much English but who loved his grandchildren with all his heart. Like many Japanese Americans of that generation, he worked as a gardener. And I remember going over to his humble house and playing in his backyard with my brother among the rows of corn and other vegetables that he grew. 
For many years, I really didn't know much about his personal history. And then, not long ago, I found out that he had spent the years of World War II in an internment camp in Arkansas. The lesson that I learned from my grandfather's life and his experiences is not perpetual grievance and contempt for America. It's exactly the opposite. What I think about is how our American system allows our society to improve and to get better. Imagine that my grandfather was in an internment camp guarded by army soldiers, but now his grandson serves as civilian aide to the secretary of the army. This journey from my grandfather in his situation to where I am in my life is a very American story, and it epitomizes Dr. Houchin's observation that the key to America's history is the extension of basic political rights and equal opportunity to all Americans. And as Dean Foreman told me when I was writing my book chapter on John Adams Academy, it's not as if America hasn't made mistakes or even started with some glaring errors, as in the case of slavery. But the beauty of American system is self-correction. Dr. Houchin says that patriotism involves a confidence that our founding documents, such as the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, represent uniquely valuable roadmaps for political organization and human progress. That means that we have faith in the core principles of the founding, including the dignity of the individual, rule of law, equal opportunity, and the opportunity for all individuals to excel through hard work, determination, and innovation. These principles also include limited government, federalism, representative democracy, and understanding that human flourishing is about far more than politics, and that institutions such as the family and religious organizations are where true happiness can be found and where humans are formed in the virtues necessary to participate and maintain a republic. Dr. Houchins makes the final important point that while we may come from different backgrounds, we share a common bond as Americans based on our founding principles. There is no America, he says, when there is nothing that unifies us beyond our different identities and divisions. And do you know who in America is the most patriotic? What group? It's not the rich, but America's poor. Up to 90% of our nation's poor classify themselves as patriotic Americans. These often destitute people say that they would rather be citizens of America than any other country on the face of the planet. They think that America is a better place to live than any other place in the world. And it's important to point out that this is not a phenomenon in other countries. The worst off in most other advanced nations are much less patriotic than the poor in America. And this is even in the case in countries where the poor receive more government benefits than the poor in America. The journalist and researcher Francesco Duina decided to investigate this phenomenon. He went to Alabama and Montana, two very different states that both are hotbeds of patriotism among the poor. He hung out in laundromats, bus stations, homeless shelters, public libraries, senior citizen centers, used clothing stores, and rundown neighborhoods. He interviewed poor Americans of different ages, genders, religions, political orientations, races, and histories of military service. What he found was amazing. Instinctively, these poor people were imbued with the patriotic feeling that Dr. Houchins had described. Many poor people with whom he talked told him that they viewed America as their last hope, both for themselves and for the world. Their patriotism offered the poor a sense of dignity, a closeness to God, and answers to most of humanity's problems. Deprive us of our country, said these people, and you deprive us 
of the only thing that is left for us to hang on to. Shirley is a 46-year-old unemployed African-American woman in Birmingham, Alabama. And she told Mr. Duena, for me to give up hope on the country in which I live is almost to give up hope for myself. So I gotta keep the light burning for me and for my country or I'm gonna be in the dark. These poor people were not envious of or angry at rich people or the American economic system. Quite the contrary. A poor man in a bus station in Billings, Montana said, people make their own life, make their own money the way they wanna make it and however much they wanna make it. That's a very different view and a different way of thinking than what a communist might think. Indeed, a great source of pride to the poor people of uh, Duena interviewed was their belief that America is the freest country on earth. They felt free to come and go to different places and to think as they wished. The patriotism of the poor, said Duena, is rooted in the widespread belief that America belongs to the people. There is a bottom-up, instinctive, protective, and intense identification with our country. In America, he found, there is no contradiction between one's difficult life trajectories and one's love of country. If anything, those in difficulty have more reasons than most of us to believe in the promise of America. Why is this finding so important? Duena concludes that poor people's love of country contributes to social stability, informs and supports America's understanding of itself as a special place, and is essential for military recruitment. Which brings me to Veterans Day. Nowhere is this patriotic phenomenon among those from difficult life situations on better display than in those who decide to serve America in our nation's armed forces. Take Stephanie Hegesheimer. Stephanie was born in Connecticut. When she was very young, her mother terminated parental rights. Her father was in prison. Over a span of 15 years, Stephanie lived in 33 different foster homes. 33! I cannot even imagine how difficult it must have been to grow up. When you look at children like Stephanie, the statistics look grim. Only 25% of foster children graduate from high school and less than 3% earn a college degree. For Stephanie, however, school became her refuge from her chaotic life. She said, I could read and that would put me in a whole different world. Stephanie overcame the odds and she graduated from high school. And when she graduated, she said that she was looking for purpose and direction to make a difference in the world. Although she had been given a full ride college scholarship, she said that she didn't feel that she would be making that difference in the world by just sitting in a college classroom. So she gave up college and enlisted in the United States Army. The Army offered her a number of different military occupational specialties, and she decided health care. Stephanie said that she always wanted to, she was always interested in saving people's lives, and it was always something that she wanted to do. She became a combat medic, and she was deployed with the 101st Combat Aviation Brigade to Afghanistan. When she returned to the United States, she applied to become an officer as part of the Army's medical, the Army Medical Department's enlisted commissioning program, which is designed for enlisted soldiers to attend and graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. Even though she was also a single mom at the time as well, she graduated with honors and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. She now works in Germany at the largest American hospital outside the United States. George Washington once said, example, whether it be good or bad, has a powerful influence. For Stephanie, the choice was simple. Live up to army values and set a good example for others. 
Stephanie said that she had to succeed, succeed to show, that, show her daughter that no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what they're throwing at you, you can do it. You're not weaker than anybody else. You're just as strong. And that American, patriotic, can-do spirit has been a common thread for men and women who have served from Washington's Continental Army to today with soldiers like Stephanie. Let me end by telling you the story of an American hero who also came from a poor family. Hiroshi Miyamura was born in 1925 in Gallup, New Mexico, which is a rough town of cowboys, rowdy bars, and bare-knuckled prize fights. Hiroshi's parents had a small diner, and they and their seven children all lived below in the basement. When he was 11, Hiroshi's mother died. His father now had to run the diner and be the single parent to seven kids. Because, his, because Hiroshi's friends couldn't pronounce his name, he took the nickname Hershey, just like the chocolate bar. Only English was spoken at home, and the whole family saw themselves as purely American. Hershey joined the Boy Scouts and played Hopalong Cassidy with his friends. The family would gather every Sunday with a few other Japanese families in town and worship at the Japanese Free Methodist Church, which was housed in an old train dining car. When World War II came, Japanese Americans on the West Coast were interned in camps for the duration of the war. In interior towns like Gallup, however, the government did not intern the Japanese Americans. In, uh, as you can imagine, though, there was ill feeling, and some towns uh, actually removed their Japanese American residents, but not in Gallup. Two Italian Americans, Gallup Sheriff Dominic Molica and the commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post, Guido Zecca, stood firm. Sheriff Molica said, they are citizens here, and we're not going to round them up. For Hershey Miyamura, who is shy and slightly built, he wanted to do two things, prove that he was a man and prove that he was an American. He joined the ROTC in his senior year in high school. He was sent to train with the Army's 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the most highly decorated unit of World War II composed of Japanese Americans. By the time he got to Europe, though, the war was ended. He stayed in the Army and was sent to Korea at the start of the Korean War in 1950. He was a squad leader of a machine gun unit on the night of the 24th of April in 1951. His position was attacked by an overwhelming force of communist Chinese. He manned his machine gun until he ran out of ammunition. He ordered his, he ordered his squad to withdraw while he stayed behind to render his gun inoperative. He then fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy, killing 10 of them, and made it to another machine gun emplacement. When the intensity of the enemy attack grew, however, Hershey could see that their position was going to be overrun. He yelled at his comrades, you guys get out of here. He stayed and covered their withdrawal with his fire from his machine gun. Then the gun jammed. Then he fired from his rifle. Then he threw grenades. Then hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued. One enemy soldier threw a grenade at Hershey, and it exploded, sending shrapnel into his leg. Yet he kept fighting, and he kept moving, trying to get back to American lines. But he collapsed from loss of blood and exhaustion. He was captured by the communists and forced march to a POW camp. During that march, he carried a wounded comrade for 10 miles until the communists ordered him to put his friend down. Hershey marched over 300 miles and was fed millet and barley ground to dust and infested with weevils. Hershey hallucinated that he was sitting at his dad's diner eating pancakes. He spent the next two years in a communist POW camp where many POWs die of starvation, dysentery, and infections. In July 1953, Hershey was released from the camp when the armistice was signed. He stood five foot ten, 
and weighed less than 100 pounds. When he entered the American base at Freedom Village in the demilitarized zone, tears streamed down his face when he saw the American flag. A U.S. Army captain came up to him and asked him if he was Corporal Hiroshi Miyamura. He said that he was, and he was taken to a Quonset hut where a Brigadier General was waiting for him. The General told him that he had been promoted to the rank of Sergeant, but that wasn't all. The General said to him, Sergeant Miyamura, you have been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. His medal citation stated, when last seen, he was fighting ferociously against an overwhelming enemy of, so of soldiers. Corporal Miyamura's indomitable heroism and consummate devotion to duty reflect the utmost glory on himself and uphold the illustrious traditions of military service. What makes a man like Hiroshi Miyamura do the incredibly brave and courageous things he did? What motivated him to sacrifice so much? In a word, patriotism. When he got back to the docks of San Francisco from Korea, the generals asked Hershey to walk down the gangplank first with the officers on the dock saluting him. When he, asked, when he was asked to say a few words, his voice shook and he said, I'm happy to be back. This is the most wonderful country in the world. In a recent article, Hershey, who is now 95 years old, said that as the truck in which he was sitting crossed the bridge into the Freedom Village, all, all I could remember is seeing a big US flag flying in the breeze and I just concentrated on that flag. That was such a wonderful sight to see the star-spangled banner fluttering in the breeze. So as we honor our veterans officially tomorrow on Veterans Day, let us also remember that it is, a, it is the patriotic love for America, love of the principles that undergird our country, and love of the freedoms that stem from those principles that form the foundation for our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, and our Coast Guardsmen's service to our nation. That is why, going forward, it is so critically important to instill in our young people that patriotic appreciation for our American heritage in our way of life. And that is why I am so proud to support John Adams Academy. You are a role model for the rest of the nation. Other schools need to emulate the informed, balanced, and thoughtful patriotic education program here at John Adams Academy. If that happens, our country will continue to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Happy Veterans Day to all of you here and who are watching this broadcast. And may God bless the United States of America.